Sudley is rightly well known for its association with the Tudors. Here, for example, is the last resting place of the remains of Catherine Parr, the last of Henry's six wives, the one who outlived them all, which of course is no mean feat given Henry's matrimonial record. Every inch of this wonderful place is steeped deeply in history. For example, this Norman Tower is the oldest existing part of the castle. If only it could talk, it would have amazing stories to tell. It looks peaceful and tranquil here today, over the countryside. But this tower would have seen the country being ripped apart during the Wars of the Roses when conflict raged around here. And it was that gruesome and bloody conflict that Sudley's close relationship with royalty first began. The Wars of the Roses. So what was all that about then? Most people have heard of the Wars of the Roses, but probably very few people actually understand about the Wars of the Roses. And that in itself is forgivable and understandable because Many people at the time probably didn't understand it either. As the wars went backwards and forwards with people changing side. Why we started this, they probably thought. Many of them probably had lost the plot. So, let's strip away all of the messy, confusing stuff and let's actually have a very simple explanation of what the Wars of the Roses was like. Just the nuts and bolts. So let's start with this chap, Edward III. Under his reign, everything seemed comparatively rosy. Oh, forgive the pun. And he had five sons, so peaceful succession was assured. But all did not quite go according to plan. Edward, the eldest son, aka the Black Prince, whilst laying siege to a French town, he caught dysentery and later died before his father. As a result, the throne passes to Edward's son, Richard, who becomes Richard II. He was just a babe in arms at the time. Well, 10 actually. But he had three uncles to look after him and run the country for him. And this is exactly what they did, especially the eldest of the uncles, John of Gaunt, AKA the Duke of Lancaster. However, as Richard got older, the more he resented his interfering relations. I want to be my own man and make my own decisions, he began to think. Trouble was, he wasn't actually much good at making decisions. When he banished his cousin Henry, John's son, now the Duke of Lancaster, to France and confiscated lands from him, enough was enough. So whilst Richard was away in Ireland, Henry slipped back into the country from France, ran his support from the nobles and barons, imprisoned Richard on his return and took the crown for himself, becoming Henry IV. Cousin love for you. This, of course, set quite an important precedent. If you had enough muscle and backing and had the blood royal, then you too could claim the throne. As it happened, all went reasonably well for Henry. He didn't face any major challenges to his throne, and he even found time to build some nice buildings. Following Henry's death, we get Henry V, his son. He perfected the old trick of distracting attention at home while bashing the French some more. Once more until the breach, dear friends, once more, Agincourt and all that. So he survived and the throne passed to his son, another Henry the Sixth. Oh dear, not cut from quite the same cloth as his father. Not only did he have a disastrous campaign in France, which his father had arranged for him to inherit as king as France, but he was subject to frequent bouts of melancholy, often taking to his bed for weeks at a time and the powerful at court soon began to lose faith in his ability to rule, and so began another power struggle. In particular, descendants from Edward III's fifth son, the Duke of York, thought that they could do a better job at running the country than Henry and his Lancastrian supporters. Eventually, the whole thing erupted in war. Both sides won victories and suffered defeats, and families and key players changed sides as the conflict continued and the balance of power shifted back and forth. Finally, in 1461, the Yorkists seized the throne and Edward IV was crowned king, deposing Henry. All seemed settled until some 10 years later when a group of powerful nobles got fed up with Edward. So they switched sides, put Henry back on the throne and Edward fled abroad. But then Henry became incapacitated again. 
Edward returns, wins a thumping victory at Tewkesbury in 1471 and takes the throne back. But things are not quite over yet. When Edward dies in 1483, his son and heir, Edward V, is just 12 years old. And before he can be crowned by his mother and her supporters, his uncle, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, places him and his brother, the princes, in the Tower of London for their own protection. The young Edward, as we shall see later, is then discredited and the crown passes to his uncle who becomes Richard III. But Richard cannot hold on to power. A number of his key supporters switch sides and join a swelling tide of support for Henry Tudor, the new Lancastrian favourite, being related to the House of Lancaster via his mother, Margaret Beaufort. Henry lands in Wales from France, raises an army and marches to challenge Richard. They clash at the Battle of Bosworth. Richard is killed, Henry is crowned king, and the War of the Roses is finally at an end, with Henry marrying Edward IV's daughter, Elizabeth York, and the Tudor dynasty is founded. Simple, isn't it? This is Cleve Hill. Had we been here in 1471, we would have had a bird's eye view of the Battle of Tewkesbury. The Lancastrians were coming up from the south. They'd been refused entry to cross the Severn over here at Gloucester. So they had to go further north and were racing to the next crossing up there. Below us is Bishop's Cleve, but further in the distance is Tewkesbury itself. Not the bloodiest of battles within the Wars of the Roses, but a very decisive one. Having failed to cross the River Severn, a number of the Lancastrian elite sought sanctuary in Tewkesbury Abbey. But sanctuary meant nothing to Edward and his brothers. The story goes that they were hauled out and together with another hundred or so Lancastrians, possibly more, they were executed the next day in the square of Tewkesbury. What that meant is that the Yorkists had not only won a battle, but in the process had eliminated many of the Lancastrian elite, ensuring that there were few who could actually rival the Yorkists now for the throne of England. So after victory at Tewkesbury, Edward had his hands on the English crown again. He of course had first come to the throne following the bloody Battle of Towton in 10 years earlier in 1461. Then he was a young, handsome, tall, 19 year old. And like most teenagers, he had sex on the brain. Enter Sudley into this story. Let's start with Eleanor Butler, the young, beautiful widow. She was the daughter of the Earl of Shrewsbury, not too unimportant himself. And she married into the Butler family, being the daughter-in-law of Sir Ralph Butler. Sir Ralph Butler had campaigned well in France and had amassed great riches through the spoils of war, which he brought back to England, and with which he decided to build himself a small, Peace saw country retreat, Sudley Castle. But Sir Ralph was a Lancastrian, and therefore, once the Yorkists were in power, found himself on the wrong side of the conflict. And what this meant is that he had to sacrifice and give up Sudley to the crown. In other words, Edward IV. Edward IV had fallen in love with this place when he has visited it before and wanted it for himself. But that's not possibly all he wanted. He fell not only in love with the castle, but with Eleanor Butler. Sometime in the early 1460s, Eleanor Butler made what proved to be a fateful decision. She decided to turn to the young Edward IV, King of England, and plea to him to return her family's possessions, the land that they once owned. Now, Edward, being the man he was, 
took this opportunity to try and get Eleanor for himself. But this Sudley love affair came back to haunt the Yorkist years later. After his unexpected death, a huge rumour was circulated that he'd been married to this Eleanor Butler before he married his subsequent queen, Elizabeth Woodville. This meant that the marriage to Woodville was invalid, that their children were bastards and therefore could not inherit the crown. Thus the crown was offered to Richard, the protecting uncle who conveniently had the two princes locked up in the tower. So how could Edward not have known if he was married or not? Oh, sorry Elizabeth, I, I love you dearly, but sorry I can't marry you. I forgot I'm married already. The point here is this, in medieval times, the law concerning marriage was confused and opaque. Fundamentally, there were two ways in which a couple could get married. Method one, you can willingly and freely exchange vows to one another in the present tense. I, William, take you, Martha, as my wife. And she could exchange that vow. And then you were married. Method two, even more confusing. You can exchange vows in the future tense. I, Edward, will take you, Martha, as my wedded wife. And if that vow was followed by sexual intercourse, the couple were then married. No church service required, no witnesses required, especially to the messy sex bit, and no signing of documents. Because of this ambiguity around the legality of marriage, young couples, particularly if exchanging vows in the future tense, would follow that up by exchanging tokens of their affection for one another. These tokens are where the present day engagement rings that we wear have their origin. But what was important is that the token would be shared. So the couple would keep one half each, and if a dispute arose, they could actually demonstrate the extent to which vows had been made. So what of Eleanor? What we do know is that she died in a nunnery in 1468. Now what's interesting is that a rumour afterwards spread that she died in childbirth, giving birth to a child of Edward IV. Now if that's true, it means that they must have had a longer lasting relationship than just a short fling at Sudley. What we also know is that Eleanor, rather surprisingly and strangely, actually returned the lands and estates that she had gained back to the crown. Very odd thing to do. So what is the moral of this story? Even if you're a king, you can't afford to mess with those Sudley girls. If it wasn't for Edward's love affair with Sudley and all things in it, then maybe the course of English history could have been entirely different. The Plantagenets could have ruled much, much longer. No Tudors, no Henry VII, no Henry VIII, no Virgin Queen. England's history would have been entirely different.